Good morning. morning. Welcome one and all to our worship service here at Maranatha Free Lutheran Church. Great to have you here as we gather in the Lord's house to worship. Special welcome to any who are visiting with us today. Uh, There is a card on the end in the pew that you could fill out with some information about yourself. If you'd like to leave that with us, we'd appreciate that. And uh, the rest of you can use that as well if you have any change of address or special prayer requests you'd like to share. Pastor Ryan is... uh, it took a week of vacation this last week, and he's coming back from the Boundary Waters and a canoeing expedition uh, today. And so he'll be refreshed and ready to be put to work this next week when we're gone. A <laughs> uh, number of announcements here. Uh, reminder, there is adult Sunday school. We're meeting in the library. Evidence that man's a verdict with Josh and Sean McDowell. Uh, today's subject, is there really such a thing as truth? Uh, schedule for the week includes uh, young adults on Monday night, uh, quilting here at the church on, on Tuesday, and also evening WMF. Uh, Wednesday, our, our regular schedule there with a supper here and, and confirmation, kids club, friendship club, and then uh, our studies both for men and women and, and saltines. Um, so something for all ages here on Wednesdays. If you haven't checked that out, I invite you to come. Thursday, notice there will not be the Elijah Bible study this week. Um, And not in the bulletin here, but just uh, so that you're aware, there is a funeral here on Friday. Uh, We had been praying for Pastor Paul Nash, and we we knew last week that he had passed away. And uh, they have, uh, we have offered our facility for a a rather large funeral here. And so that will be taking place on Friday at 11 o'clock. And thank you to Several of you who are helping out with lunch and, and uh, some ushering and, and things of that nature um, this week connected to that. Men's Fellowship will meet for breakfast on Saturday and then our worship service and Sunday school at regular time next week. A number of things to be aware of coming up there as well, including a district uh, youth retreat in November. And uh, parents, you should be getting information and a brochure uh, brought home to you soon if you haven't gotten that already. Uh, Jill Toms has an announcement. I'll call on her at this time. Good morning. On Rally Sunday, your students should have brought home a devotion that's called Keys for Kids. Uh, And there was one that's called Unlocked for Teens. Um, Today we also have a special edition, Uh, it's the Harvest Edition. They are on the back table, so we ask that you pick one up. It's about a two-week devotional. Um, It's got some activities in it as well that are um, some fall activities that have biblical applications. So it's kind of fun for the kids to go through and do, so please enjoy and grow closer to God through these. Thank you. Are there any other announcements that should be made or any special prayer concerns that you'd like to share today? We got a text from Chris Finstrom just updating us on Pastor Dale. He's had uh, some good and some bad days here. Um, Last night didn't sleep much and uh, really, again, seems to be having some fluid buildup on the lungs. And and so a lot of coughing and challenge here for him. Uh, So be in prayer for, for Dale. And for Chris, uh, the good news was that uh, they have decided to let Laura come up and see your dad today. So, glad for that. Any other prayer requests you have? Call to worship today comes from Psalm 103. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens. His kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his work, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all of his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all of his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. I invite you to join with me as we do that, as we praise the Lord together. Uh, All creatures of our God and King is number 63 in your celebration hymnal. And and notice the... uh, Different verses as we sing them, uh, inviting all of God's creation to to join in worship of our Lord. I invite you to stand as we sing.
Please be seated. As we come before the one who is in charge of all things, the one who has created all that we sung about and so on, we recognize our own smallness, our own weakness, our sinfulness, and we bow before him in confession of that sin. Please join in the confession there in your bulletin. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake, grant us forgiveness of all of our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord God, we give you thanks today that in Jesus there is forgiveness of all of our sin. And we rest in the promise of your word that tells us if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we pray that you would work within each of our hearts. Uh, in our will, Lord, and in our um, daily lives. Uh, may you empower us to live in a relationship with you and to serve you, to live in daily repentance and faith. Lord, we bring before you those from our fellowship that are going through some challenges, and, and we ask for your healing touch, Lord, upon them. Pray for Mabel and Henry Singer, for Bruce and Sheila Smith. We pray for Pastor Dale Finstrom, and for Chris, and, and for Laura, and, and for their family, Lord, in this time. We, we pray for your healing touch upon Dale, Lord, that you would strengthen his body again, Lord, that you would uh, help his lungs to function better. If that would be your will, Lord, we, we pray for change in that even today. And we ask your, your blessing on um, Laura and, and uh, her dad as they have time together today, Lord. We thank you for that. We, we pray, Lord, for uh, John Rudum, for Tim Sievertson, for Peggy, Peggy Gallagher, and others, too, that come to my mind but that we have uh, health concerns with, Lord, we, we ask for your healing touch. Think of those that are grieving, Lord, and, and we lift up to you, uh, John and Terry Enloe, um, Loss and their family. Lord, we pray also for uh, the family of uh, Pastor Nash and, and for the funeral that will take place this week. Lord, we, we ask that you would bring comfort to their hearts and strengthen them and, and uh, provide for their needs and guide their future, Lord. Uh, we lift up to you those... Uh, working in the fields uh, this busy time of year for farmers, and we ask that you'd protect, Lord, for, for the work that is done, and that you would help them to get the crops off in, in good time this season. We pray, Lord, for ministries here in our church, and we think of uh, confirmation students, and we thank you for each one that you have uh, brought to part of our fellowship and for the studying that they are doing as they meet week by week and, and memorize and learn things, Lord. We pray that the uh, word that is shared would uh, would plant deep in their hearts, and that you would um, have your way in each of their hearts and lives, that they would each know you personally. We lift up to you, uh, Stephanie Dahl, and little baby on the way, Lord. We thank you for that and pray for your continued development there. We ask, Lord, for your, your blessing on Pastor Ryan as he's coming back from the Boundary Waters, and thank you for that opportunity to get away with some friends. We pray, Lord, also for uh, Peter Ward and, and Marianne as they serve in Newland. Uh, bless and continue to strengthen them for that work and, and and we pray for your encouragement to that congregation. We lift up to you the class of 2018. Uh, Mackenzie, Trevor, Bailey, Ashley, Wyatt, Hunter, Clay, Madison, and Brittany, Lord. You know where each of them are at this time, Lord, and we pray that uh, you would draw their hearts to look to you and, and uh, that they would seek your, your will for their lives. We think of uh, our, our Bible college, Lord, and, and uh, Pastor Adam Osier. Pray that you would... Um, bless him as he serves in that way this year and, and uh, continue to provide for his family. Pray for the church in Butte, Montana, as they are without a pastor. We ask that you would provide for them each week in their pulpit. Think of uh, Joel and Marianne Rolf serving in Starbuck. Uh, we pray your blessing on that work. And pastor Todd and Barb Shirkoke in Mexico. Pray for Laura, as I already have, Laura, but also as she um, has been serving in Hungary. We ask that you would work out things for that. 
Uh, we, we pray, Lord, for more men for the, for the ministry as we continue to have a shortage of AFLC pastors. And Lord, we, we pray that uh, you'd open the door again for ministry within the jails on, on both sides of the river and that you would continue to uh, bless the, the ministry that is going on, Lord. Uh, strengthen those serving in various uh, capacities as, as public servants. And Lord, we pray also for uh, Farm in the Dell and as they finish out their season uh, of the gardens. And Lord, we ask uh, as we think of our nation, we ask that you would humble hearts and those in leadership of our land. And, and Lord, that there would be a turning to you that would take place. And, and Lord, that there would be a willingness to come together to uh, think through what is truly best for our country. And, and Lord, there seems to be such an impasse there at times, but we pray that somehow you would bring change there. And Lord, we lift up to you those serving um, in various parts of the world. And we think of uh, those that are going through times of persecution. And uh, we pray for uh, various nations, Lord, the nation of Brunei, and, and ask for your, your uh, provision for, for believers there. And we pray for the nation of Israel and pray that there would be hearts that are drawn to Jesus there. We pray in his name. Amen. And Mandarin will be reading scripture at this time. I invite you to stand in reverence to God's word as, as we read. Our Old Testament lesson comes from 1 Kings 21, verses 17 through 25, which is page 283 in the Pew Bible. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in Naboth's vineyard, where he has gone to take possession of it. Say to him, this is what the Lord says, have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, this is what the Lord says. In this place where dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, yours. Ahab said to Elijah, so you have found me, my enemy. I have found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. I am going to bring disaster on you. I will consume your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and that of Basha, son of Ahijah, because you have provo provoked me to anger and have caused Israel to sin. And also concerning Jezebel, the Lord says, dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city, and the birds of the air will feed on those who die in the country. There was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. The gospel lesson is from Matthew 21, starting in verse 33, and that's page 776 in the Pew Bible. Matthew 20, 21, 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? 
He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. Here ends the lessons. Please join with me as we together confess what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. This time we have uh, Brian and Caleb Dahl sharing special music. Good morning. We're going to sing a song called He Hideth My Soul. Um, it's in the red hymnal. If you guys want to follow along with us, it's uh, 571 is the number. And I uh, just encourage you, if you know this hymn, an old classic, if you just want to sing the chorus with us, that would be amazing. Wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burdens away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. And the numberless blessings each moment he comes and filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a Redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the depths of the rock, and shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love, and Transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with a million on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land. 
much some powerful words of encouragement for us who are believers in Christ there you have the opportunity at this time to give back to the Lord uh, so you give him tithes and offerings the ushers will be coming forward for that and um, during that we'll, we'll ask you to join in singing number 547 your ambassador hymnal the light of the world is Jesus lost in Lord, we believe that, and we want that light to spread, and so we commit ourselves to serve you, and we give these gifts back in order that uh, your gospel would be proclaimed here and, and far away, that others too would know the hope that only Jesus gives. We pray in his name. Amen. I have occasionally found when reading scripture that there's a word or a phrase that kind of seems to jump off the page at me as it seems so relevant to current life situations or, or at times when it seems like the author of that scripture was reading news headlines even today as he describes a culture even in his own day. And, and today's text has a phrase like that. It, it, it describes living in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Some other translations call it a crooked and perverse generation or crooked and depraved 
generation and all words that fit with what I see uh, in much of society and the world around us these days. And as the Apostle Paul writes into Christians at Philippi who are living in such a society as well almost 2,000 years ago, these verses uh, in today's text, then um, he again brings us some imperatives, actually three imperatives, three command or request statements that, uh, that seem maybe both hard to understand and also hard to do. I invite you to look with me at Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 12 through 18. And if you're using your uh, Philippians uh, journal, it's on page 12 in there, right at the top. I invite you to stand in reverence to God's word as we read. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad, and I rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that uh, your Holy Spirit would open up your word to us, that we would understand it and know how to apply it, Lord, to our own hearts and lives. And Lord, we pray that he would be our teacher. And Lord, that you would guide each of us to, to walk in a relationship with you and to be lights in this world. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, just what are those three imperatives in this text? Uh, they're the three parts in the bold in your outline, if you're looking at that in your bulletin. One, work out your own salvation. Two, do all things without grumbling or disputing. And then three, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Those are hard statements to understand or accept either because they maybe in one case seem contrary to what we already know about or from Scripture, or because they seem contrary to our own human nature and experience. First of all, then, work out your own salvation. This does not mean we are in any way saved by our works. One of the essential principles of Bible interpretation is to weigh Scripture with Scripture. And so if we come to a verse that puzzles us because it might sound contrary to something we already knew, then there's good reason for us to look at other clear statements about that subject in order to get added clarity from Scripture. The Apostle Paul very clearly speaks about that in Ephesians chapter 2. And he says there, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It is not a result of works, lest anyone should boast. New Testament makes it quite clear in many places. Our salvation is fully accomplished by God through the death of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Forgiveness of sin and eternal life, then, is fully a gift. There is not one tiny thing that we can do to help earn it in any way. So then what is this saying? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is not speaking about our justification, but rather about our sanctification, which, which the Catechism defines in this way, sanctification is the gracious work of the Holy Spirit whereby he day by day renews the believer more and more after the image of God. However, though sanctification is declared to be a work of the Holy Spirit, yet there is a sense in which we have a part. That is, in order for spiritual growth to take place, there has to be some kind of cooperation on our part. It is possible for a believer in Jesus Christ to resist the Holy Spirit and neglect the means that he has given to speak to us and to cause growth in our lives. And it's even possible to do so to the point of where we fall away from the faith and go lost. And that's a very sobering reality. And so with that in mind, we are rather urged here to work on 
a life of faith all the way to the finish. As an athlete who is running a long race, needs to keep his eye or at least his mind on that finish line and, and to make linear progress toward that goal or else he might drop out of the race. So we are to keep our sights set on the finish line of heaven and we are to live out a life of faith on a daily basis as Paul says here and to do it even with fear and trembling. Not a fear or a terror of God but an awareness of our own human nature and a concern about our tendency to wander from the right path. R.C.H. Lenski explains it in this way. He says, The Christian does not dread God who gives him, <coughs> excuse me, who gives him the life-giving gospel, but he does dread the poison of sin that robs him of strength to work out salvation of himself. However, at the same time as we tremble at the reality of our own human weakness, Paul encourages us to look away from that and, and to look then to the reality of the divine and, and to God's ongoing work within us. Recognizing then that, that the will and, and the empowerment to live the Christian life is not from ourselves, but it's God that is mightily at work in us. Verse 13, he says that here, for it is God who works in you. It's God who is working effectively and productively. It is God who is putting forth the power in our lives. And, and he has no limits to what he can do with a life that is yielded to him. However, we're not always so yielded, are we? And that's why the next part of verse 13 here is so encouraging to me. Notice what it says there. For it is God who works in you both to will and, and to work. Now, now what's he saying there? Well, when we become Christians, God works a change in our hearts. He, he gives us a new nature that, that longs to follow then the will of God. And, and we still, though, have that old nature that is determined to live for self and, and to do whatever we want. And that's why we pray, as we did even today in the confession of sin. Grant us forgiveness of all of our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us what? True knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word. So what is our part? Which to humble ourselves and to pray and to listen then to God speak to our hearts through the word and, and the sacraments and then in his strength to obey what he has said. Lenski said this, if God is the one who works in us both the willing and the working, then we Christians must ever go to God whose continuous grace will move us to will and also to translate the willing into deeds. Verse 13 said, For it is God who works in you both to will and to work. For what? For his good pleasure. That, that is in fulfillment then of God's benevolent purposes for our lives. God has plans for each of our lives. And, and he wants to use us for his glory and for the advancement of his kingdom. And, and so then the question is, will we allow him to do so? Or will we settle for so much less by thinking we want to control our own lives and our own destinies? I remember well, it was during my second year of Bible college, that I was really struggling through the call of God to full-time Christian ministry. And, and see, during the summer before, I'd, I'd gotten to travel with this ambassador gospel team and, and sing in churches all over the U.S. And, and we visited in and stayed overnight in homes of total strangers. And I'd gotten my first experience of counseling at, at a Bible camp, and, and I had this realization that God could even use me. It, and that was exciting. But the thought of being a pastor and having to be up front and speak in front of people regularly scared me. <laughs> and besides that, I had some other plans for my life that were a whole lot more comfortable than that. I had all kinds of excuses of why I shouldn't be a pastor, and... Somebody else would be better at it, and so on. And, and, and one after another, through the word of God, the, the Lord um, took away all those excuses. And, and I had to get to this point where I said, Okay, God, I guess I'm willing if you'll equip me. And, and he did. It, through my years of college life, through seminary book learning, and 
mentoring there and through a valuable internship experience, uh, when I got to my first pastoral call, I was much more prepared. But still, honestly, for those first three years, I felt sick to my stomach every Sunday morning. And it was only by praying for his strength that I could get up front. And I did so, and, and each time, God was faithful to, when I got up there, melt away the nervousness and empower me to share his word each week. Well, 30 years have come and gone, and, and God continues to work on my stubborn will and also to equip and to empower me. And at times I still struggle with that call and, and God's plans for my life. But I know that God is at work within me. And I, and I share that, I guess, simply because of this. I, I, I do know from personal experience that what this verse is talking about. God is able to change our will and also to empower us in whatever he calls us to do. However, the next imperative is one that I still really struggle with. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. How many of you succeed at doing that? Me neither. Matter of fact, sometimes I think this past year and a half, I've probably become better at grumbling than ever. Grumbling, that, that word means, it, it's an expression of dissatisfaction, murmuring, muttering in a low voice. In the Old Testament, the children of Israel in the wilderness grumbled a lot, and God was not pleased with them, and then they grumbled both at Moses, their leader, and, and at God. And you know, and when we grumble, isn't it often at people that are in charge of things? But when we think about it, if we really believe that God is ultimately in charge, then isn't our grumbling also at him for what he's allowed in our lives? Verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Now that disputing word here, um, in the Greek it has this... Um, connotations of, of a, really an inward questioning going on. Skeptical questioning and criticism uh, against God. Now, as far as I can tell, doing all things without grumbling or disputing is, is something that is humanly impossible to do. Because grumbling just comes so naturally for us, doesn't it? It starts so young and it slips out so easily. And yet we are called to do so. And to do so in the power of God. And I don't think that any grumbling is a good thing, but if I understand right, this text is especially then speaking about grumbling or complaining against God and questioning Him. And why is that a concern that Paul is addressing here? Look at verse 15. He says, That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Blameless, innocent without blemish. Now, as far as I can tell, that isn't saying that Christians must succeed at being perfect because we all know that we are far from that. We are only considered blameless in God's sight because we have been given Christ's righteousness in exchange for our sin and guilt. So what is this speaking of then? It is pointing us to the importance of our words and our actions backing up what we say we believe. And if we are living in open rebellion against God in some area of our life, or if we're grumbling against God and openly questioning his ways, then how will we help to point someone else to the salvation that's available in Jesus Christ? We're seeking to live our lives as examples in a society that doesn't know God or their need for his salvation. And so we do so aware that we are living then in the midst of what Paul calls here a crooked and twisted generation. Now what's crooked mean? Simple definition, not straight, huh? Curved. Truth is something that is straight. Lies are crooked, and they bend in all directions. And there's a lot of lying and deception going on around us these days, and it seems to me there's something not good in some of the higher levels of government and in their connections with big tech and big pharma. And there are lies and deception and manipulation that make it really tough for us to know just what we should believe. And there are those who seem even determined to take advantage of crisis and to even make crisis in order to push through their agendas. And now some are even encouraging employees to turn in their employer if he or she isn't forcing all their employees to get vaccinated or get fired. 
we live in a crooked generation that, that seems to have lost its common sense and its ability to reason and, and who acts on emotion. The governor of, of California recently signed legislation that aims to ban the sale of gas-powered lawn equipment and generators and other small engines designed for off-road booths um, and, and to do so by 2024. Just wait a couple years. If you want to get a good lawnmower, there should be a lot of used lawnmowers coming out of California. Beyond that, though, even he has signed an executive order that bans the sale of new passenger cars that are powered with the internal combustion engine by 2035. You wonder where all of this will lead. We live in a crooked and a twisted generation. That word twisted means distorted or, or perverse, uh, referring to an abnormal moral condition. And where is that more um, apparent than with gender issues these days in our society? Superman will be coming out in the new DC Comics as bisexual. Not to be outdone, Marvel Comics, Captain America will be gay. And there's also a recently appointed ELCA church bishop that's transsexual and a national assistant head of health and human services advising us in country um, on health issues that is transsexual. And those examples are, are touted really as advances in our society. We live in a crooked and twisted or perverted generation. And our goal as Christians is, is that we would shine as lights in the midst of a dark world. We sang earlier today here about the light of the world is Jesus. We are to reflect the light of Jesus to a lost and dark world. And how do we do that? Paul says in verse 16, we seek to live as such lights by holding fast to the word of life. The Bible, the inerrant word of God, is the lamp that shows us our sin and points us to our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is the word of God that gives spiritual life to those who are spiritually dead. It is the word of God that gives us truth when you don't know what to believe. And, and Paul says we shine as lights in the world as we hold fast to the word of life. Just a couple other things here in the text. We, we do so. We live as lights in this world with the concern that those who have lived the life of faith ahead of us would not have run or labored in vain. Now, why would you run or labor if there is no purpose for it, no reward at the end? if all that was worked for is lost. Most of us know of, of folks, uh, maybe from previous generations, who have lived the life of faith ahead of us and, and have shown us the way. And I, I think of many, many pastors, some of my relatives and some dear parishioners that I've looked up to who have now gone on to their eternal reward and glory. We build on what they labored for and we don't want to throw that away by careless and purposeless living. The last imperative here in verse 18, Paul says this. He says, you should be glad and rejoice with me. And he's talking about, in verse, eight, or verse 17 here, he said, even if I am poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Well, Paul is saying here, even if I end up being martyred for the faith, beheaded so that my blood is poured out like a sacrificial offering, even if that is what's coming for me, I rejoice. Why? Because God can use that to advance the cause of the gospel, and that's what I'm here for. Three imperatives in this text. Work out your salvation. Work out your own salvation. And that involves then living a life of faith all the way to the end. And doing so then daily looking to the power of God that mightily works within us. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Because we live in a crooked and twisted generation that desperately needs Jesus, the light of the world. And so we then aim to live in such a way that they'll see him in us. And then you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Paul's great joy was to see the gospel of Jesus Christ spreading. No matter what that took, even if it meant his death. May our greatest joy be seeing the gospel of God advance and being a part then of leading other souls to Christ. Let's pray. 
Lord, thank you for this book of Philippians. It's, it's rich because it so clearly points us to the gospel of Jesus Christ being the hope of the world. And we have such a personal touch from Paul as he lived out his life, empowered by you, Lord. And in some ways, we, we hold him up when we're amazed at his mindset, Lord. But we, we know the rest of the story, too, of how you worked in his heart and brought that radical change in his life. And we thank you for that, Lord. And we pray that we would look to Jesus, that we would remember that he is the hope for this world. He is the light of the world. And Lord, as we live in this crooked and twisted generation, and it seems that things uh, go down a path further and further away from you, uh, Lord, we pray that the result would be that our light would be even brighter, shining in contrast to that and that that light would be one that's reflecting Jesus. Lord, that others would know the hope that he gives, the, the forgiveness of sin and eternal life that is offered, and how that changes life and, and shapes our perspective in this life and, and gives us wisdom and discernment regarding the things that we deal with around us. And we thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn to number 512 in your ambassador hymnal, Not What My Hands Have Done, a hymn that reminds us uh, that it's not our own power and strength, but what God does as he works within us. 512 in your ambassador hymnal. Please stand with me. Let's uh, together turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer and join in the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Just a reminder, you're sure welcome to stay for some coffee and fellowship in our fellowship hall right after our service today. And also Sunday school will be starting in about 20 minutes. And so I encourage you to stay for that. Uh, adults will be meeting again in the library. Receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Closing chorus today, you are my all in all.